Hey guys, and welcome to Petroped, and welcome to the Audi R8. Now, as you can tell from that opening sequence, the V10 in the back of this car sounds absolutely sensational, and the performance is pretty epic as well. Now, this isn't the first R8 I've had on the channel. In fact, the Audi R8 was the first ever supercar I drove, and I still remember that day fondly. But this car is being discontinued this year. We say goodbye to the R8 this year, a little bit like the Kia Stinger I had on the channel last week. And I think that's a great shame. I've always had a soft spot for an Audi R8, being a bit of an Audi fanboy. I've owned a couple of TTs, a couple of S4s. I've always seen the R8 in any showroom I take my car to be serviced in and walk around them. And I think they're an awesome, awesome car. But I really wanted to spend some time in it to say goodbye but this particular R8 is quite a special one. This is an Audi R8 V10 Performance Rear Wheel Drive Edition. Now, again, I've driven the rear wheel drive R8 on the channel a couple of years ago now, but only for a very short period of time. I didn't really get underneath its skin and underneath its kind of nature, if you like. So I wanted to do that with this car. So I've had this car for the last week. I've done about 700 miles and I've learned an awful lot. So. During this video, we're gonna drop into my week with the Audi R8 and see how I got on. So the first thing I wanted to explore was, every time you see a review of one of these, people call it the everyday supercar, the supercar you could daily. So I put that theory to the test this week. Could you drive this car to work on a frosty morning and feel okay about it? Is it a supercar you could use on the daily commute? <laughs> morning <laughs> so it's very very cold this morning but i thought i'd do the ultimate cold start listen to this it is sub-zero i really need to defrost the car gonna do a living with video of a supercar you gotta use it every day beautiful sunny morning though ah, there you go all done now let's put my heated seats onto the max uh, I might put some max blowers on just for a little bit oh, I reckon we're nearly ready to go Beautiful Broadway in the Cotswolds, one of my favorite places. But I've always put the R8 into that usable everyday supercar camp, I guess much like a 911. You don't need to, you know, cosset it overnight on a trickle charger. I got up this morning, it's sub-zero, it's covered in frost, it started first time. It defrosted really easily. I've now got a nice warm bum from my heated seats and I'm driving it to work, and you could do that with an R8 every day. I'd question whether you would do that, just from a kind of cost point of view, but it is certainly a car that you could daily. And one of the things I wanted to do this week is to literally live with the car for a week um, and do nice things, um, but also go to work. So the drive I've got each day this week is around about 20 miles from just near Broadway to uh, Cheltenham and it's a nice little bit of there's a few nice twisty bits of road it's particularly cold this morning so obviously you kind of take it nice and easy and the potholes in the Cotswolds are just shocking at the moment but you could definitely daily this car it's so easy to drive it just when you're doing this kind of trip it doesn't feel like a supercar it, it's a special car to be in, don't get me wrong, but it's not edgy and spiky and horrible to drive. It's just super easy to drive. But that V10, when it just gets up to just beyond 5,000 RPM, it opens its throat and it just sounds mega. Really, really mega. Unfortunately, what it also does is when it gets to around about 5,000 RPM, you can feel the power come in as well and it starts to propel you down the road at a very rapid rate of knots. I mean, that's only four and a half thousand. 
here we go. <laughs> Halfway through the rev range. Oh dear, what a what a weapon, what an absolutely amazing car. <laughs> now that was maximum RPM, but like a quarter throttle. I mean, if you bury the throttle in this, you really do launch at the horizon. But I'm gonna to get to work today with the moronic grin on my face that's pretty much gonna last all day. And then, then I get to, you know, reignite the moronic grin on the drive home, and then it will stay with me all evening. Wicked. So here we go. The end of my commute. And I'm gonna park up in a car park, which I guess for, some of you might be like, oh, I can't park a supercar in a car park, but ultimately, you've got to park it somewhere, right? Super easy to park, lots of parking cameras. It's a little bit wider than something like a TT. Beep, 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 beep. That'll do. There you go. Now, I'm going to work. And then just before I go into work, final thing to look at is car park space size. Actually, it's not too bad. Space around both sides. Perfect. Right, let's go and do some work. Now, spec-wise, I am mildly in love with this car. First up, the colour. This is Kimura Grey Metallic. And it's got a little bit more depth and more colour than something like Nardo Grey. And whenever you have a Nardo Grey press car, people always put in the comments, oh, did they forget to paint it? It looks like it's just got primer. This, this is a really interesting colour. It's got lots and lots of texture and lots of, you can see the crease work and the, the, the different angles in the bodywork. It's beautiful. And then in terms of spec, there's only two big spec options on this car. It has the carbon pack, so you've got carbon mirror caps, carbon skirts, blades. Inside, there's loads of carbon work. I'll show you a bit later on. Now, that carbon pack is £9,000 as an option. And then it has some very special RS carbon seats, which, again, we'll show you on the inside. They are quite an expensive option as well. But they're the only two options the car has. The one it doesn't have is the ceramic brake option, but it does have this beautiful kind of bronze wheel, which goes so well with the Kimura Grey. So it's just got steel rotors. And I have to say on the road, to be fair, they are mega anchors. They're gonna stop you. Clearly, if you wanted lower unsprung mass or if you're doing lots more track days, maybe the carbon ceramics would be a better option, but clearly they come with a price tag as well. But honestly, the brakes on the public road are great. But the next question is, with those brakes, could I set a lap record at Goodwood? Now, normally, I'd be coming to Goodwood in an R8 to do a track day. Today's a track day of sorts. I am going round the track. I'm just running round the track because today is the Chichester 10K. And it looks really, really popular. <laughs> There's suddenly like 100 million cars turned up. So yeah, so the 10K starts on the start finish straight at Goodwood. It goes around the motor circuit, then it goes out onto the road down to Rolls-Royce, then back down the Lavent Strait, back onto the circuit, and then finishes on the start finish straight, I think. This is all part of my preparation towards Ironman Marbella, which is getting scarily close. The paddocks are as busy today as they are for any kind of track day or event here, but I'm all parked up. I now need to go and get my race number because I registered really late. So let's go and get that. And then it's just a case of running 10K. No worries. I've got my number, I'm signed on. I've bought water because like an idiot, I left my recovery shake in the fridge and my water bottles at home, <laughs> which isn't very good, but brilliant atmosphere. We've got, what have we got? About half an hour before we kick off an absolutely stunning day. I've not done a competitive 10K. I don't think I've ever done a competitive 10K. I've done the Great South Run, which is 10 miles. 
and I've done a marathon, but this is the first one of these I've done, which is really cool. And it's a beautiful day. It's quite a flat course today. So target time, uh, anything under 55 minutes, I will be super chuffed with, but we'll see. A good day. Here we go, here we go. That is absolutely perfect. Well done. Throughout this pace stages here, make sure you're high in the final. If that is the time you're able to There you go, all done. I said I'd be happy with under 60 minutes. Under 55 would be good. Under 50, baby. 49.03. That was very, very difficult. They had pacemakers, which are really cool. The guys, you can see the ones behind me there. They were the. 55 minute pace so i just found the 50 minute pace guy and literally just followed him the whole way around absolutely destroyed by the end of it but next important thing ring the pb bell get back in the r8 go home and sleep <laughs> smashed my pb god yeah i'm so chuffed with that so, there you go. You can bring an R8 to a track there, Goodwood, and get a lap record. Well, chuff with that. Now in here is an absolute tour de force. A 5.2 litre naturally aspirated V10. And I think this is the reason I'm so sad to see this car go. We're just not gonna see engines like this in the future. It's a stunning, stunning unit. Power-wise, this particular unit's producing 570 PS, 550 Newton meters of torque. This car will breach the 200 mile an hour mark. I think the top speed's 204 miles an hour. And you'll hit 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds. It's a quick, quick car. And I have to say the carbon pack, you've got this amazing kind of carbon work all lining the engine bay. It looks stunning and you can see it through this glass um, lid. But up until very recently, the Audi R8 was a Quattro four-wheel drive car. And when you drive a Quattro R8, you can really tap into one of these things. You can bury your foot and drive like a hooligan and the car kind of helps you out. This one is rear wheel drive. And I must say, it is rear-wheel drive. It has so much traction, it's unbelievable. It almost feels like a four-wheel drive car sometimes. But what you get is a lighter front and a, just a more, I don't know, a more engaged drive. But the big question is, is having 570 horsepower, a big naturally aspirated V10 and rear-wheel drive intimidating? So um, earlier on in the week, um, I gave the keys to Mrs. Petroped and we took the dogs to the pub and she had a drive. I think Mrs. Greaves. Well, it's certainly nippy. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, can you use the R8 to go to the pub with the dogs? Absolutely. And let Mrs. Petroped drive. What's the point in having it otherwise? <laughs> Now, annoyingly, I did actually set up GoPros and the batteries just failed on my main GoPro. Oh, so, what a shame. I know, I know. So I'm having to use my phone, my phone. Um, but um, the very kind guys at Audi UK put Mrs. PP on the insurance. Now, this isn't the first supercar you've driven though, is it? No, it isn't. Tracy actually drew, drove a supercar before I did. You drove a McLaren 650S many years ago now at Goodwood. Yes, but you do like your Audis. Yeah, I'm a big Audi fan. Big I Audi fan. My um, S4 Avant. Um, I had two of those, and I just think they're really solid, really well-made cars. So yeah, big fan. And this one, 155 grand R8 supercar. Yeah, you can buy a house for that. <laughs> Go on then, give us your feedback. Well, as I was just saying. It's really light in the steering for such a powerful car uh, and I would have thought going around the motor circuit in Goodwood with you know someone who really knows what they're doing must be quite incredible um, you know from a performance point of view it's got all the power literally just at your fingertips yeah um, so I think if you know you know what you're 
doing, uh, you can have a lot of fun with this car. Yeah, and here we are at the pub, White Horse in Grafham. Highly recommended if anyone's in the area, by the way. Great Sunday lunch. Mega Sunday lunch. Oh, look, there's a nice little parking space just behind, next to that pond. Look, just to the right, just there. Also, park at the front. Oh, okay. Get you. In a supercar, let's park at the front. It's nearer for the girls. Yeah, oh, look at that. Just to the right of that red one. Look there. Well done. <laughs> that was a look of disgust from you, wasn't it? Yep. <laughs> this is the reward. The best Sunday lunch in our local area. Absolutely mega and all sat next to a lovely log fire. Now I really do think the R8 has matured and aged well. I think the early cars, there were elements of them that looked a little bit awkward, but I think as the generations have gone on, those things have improved and the last and final generation of the R8 for me is just spot on and it, it's the front of the car I love the most. It's just got this awesome looking stance. And in this particular color combo with the sort of black accents, and then you can also see that carbon pack extending along this front splitter with some lovely carbon work. But this week I've actually been working away from home, so I needed to pack up and leave the house quite early. Um, so what's it like from a practicality point of view? Because I guess a lot of people are gonna get one of these to do things like drive tours. Now clearly we've just seen the back of the car, there's no luggage space at the back. In the front though, you do have a front boot. It's not massive in there, but how did I get on this week? Practicality wise, I'm only going away for four nights. There's only me and um, I pretty much filled the R8. The front boot is full of my all my camera gear that I need to take away and a couple of bags. It's not a massive space. I've actually got my main clothes bag in the footwell of the passenger side and then behind me I've got a coat and my bag with things like my laptop. So there's a little bit of room left behind my driver's seat. But that's it. it. There's not a massive amount of space. So I'd imagine if you were doing a, a drive tour, especially if there were two of you in the car, you'd need to um, pack imaginatively. You'd be using squashy bags, I'm sure, because it's not it's not the most practical. That front boot isn't nearly as big as my Boxster or something like a Porsche 911, for example. It, it's relatively small. Now inside this cabin is a really very special place. It's got this beautiful Alcantara headlining with this diamond stitching, but the standout feature has to be these seats. Now these are a 3,250 pound option, Recaro RS bucket seats. They look beautiful but they've got a very cool feature which I kind of didn't realize until I was sat at a traffic lights and I turned around and I noticed that they've got Bang & Olufsen written in them. And I'm like, oh, what's that? And then as you turn your head, you notice that they've got speakers right in the back of the headrest just here. And the Bang & Olufsen sound system in this car, and I know you've got the best sound system ever just behind that nice V10, but if you want to listen to some music, the sound system is awesome. But the really clever trick is, as you're driving and looking that way, you can't really hear the, the elements of the noise you're hearing coming from the headrest, but it gives you this amazing surround sound. And you only really hear it if you turn your head and kind of put your ear in, you can hear what's coming out of the, uh, the, the seats. And it's, it's really, really very cool. But the big question is, these are fixed in position. They're a little bit like the Porsche, um, uh, 918 carbons where you can't move them that way so what are they like from a comfort point of view I did a good two hours or so in the car how comfortable were they now I've turned off the dual carriageway and we are now in the Cotswolds and what a beautiful beautiful morning it is however just worth noting I've been in the car just over two hours I did have a quick stop for fuel and to grab a coffee and I've got quite a numb bum. These seats look fantastic, 
but there are they are quite narrow I've got quite narrow hips anyway but I can just feel pressure either side of me buttocks and it's just just a little bit of um, an ache I could do with just getting out and having a stretch so if you were going to be doing lots of kind of miles in this car on drive tours and things I'm not sure how practical and how comfortable these seats would be and they're quite an expensive option but then they do look really really cool now there is something missing from this car in fact this car doesn't have something that you will find in almost every new car available today any guesses touch screen this car has no touch screen at all it is all buttons you've got Audi's amazing virtual cockpit um, which you can have your sat nav on and you can control that either through the jog wheel controls here exactly what I used to have in my old Audi S4 or you can actually control it through some controls on the steering wheel drive select is a button on the steering wheel start stops just there or my climate control is just there there's no big iPad stuck on the dash it's wicked in here however <laughs> when I got in it I'm like oh no how am I going to do my sat nav? Does it do Apple CarPlay? Well, when I set off for my week away, firstly, I had to leave very early, which might have annoyed the neighbours a little bit. But I was worried about how I was going to do my navigation. I'm a big CarPlay fan. So how did I get on with Apple CarPlay? On a longer trip, one of the things that has surprised me about this car is it's actually on the motorway, when you're cruising along like I am now at 70 miles an hour, in top gear it's actually a really quiet smooth normal car you wouldn't necessarily know that you're in a supercar as soon as you put your loud pedal down it's a supercar but the other thing that I was quite surprised about and it's my bad for not doing the research this car's got virtual cockpit there's no central screen it's lovely in that way it's all proper buttons there's no touch screen in this at all so I just assumed that it wouldn't do Apple CarPlay I prepared myself for sticking my phone on the windscreen so I could use Waze on my phone but when I plug my phone into the USB cable up pops Apple CarPlay in the middle of the virtual cockpit which is brilliant. You have to control it using the uh, jog wheel and stuff there and, and Apple CarPlay's interface hasn't really been designed to be used with a, a jog wheel but you can still use it, it just takes a little bit of getting used to. And that makes this car for me, there's nothing wrong with the inbuilt sat nav, but I'm a big fan of Waze, I go on about it all the time. I like the warnings about things like potholes and speed cameras and stopped cars on the road, especially on smart motorways and dual carriageways. I just find it really useful. So that's a really nice addition. I'm not sure how long Audi have been doing that with the virtual cockpit cars. I guess this is the only one where they would need to do that. So the final thing is, and this probably isn't a massively important factor to lots of people buying supercars, but I've done a lot of miles in the car. How much fuel did I use? Now, clearly, you're going to be putting Super Plus or high octane fuel in here. What the highest you can get either, you know, if you can get V Power or Tesco Momentum at 99, fill your boots. Otherwise, it's probably 97 here in the UK. That is, I know it varies in different countries, but just what kind of economy am I going to get out of an Audi? R8 V10 with a 5.2 litre 570 PS engine behind me. Well, shall we see how I got on? So what's it like on the go-go juice? Well, I'm on my way home after a week away in the Cotswolds. Let me just give you an update in terms of my mileage. So, so far I've done 600 miles in this car um, and my average MPG is 17.9. Yes, that big five litre naturally aspirated V10 behind me may well sound awesome, may well propel this car at the horizon like nothing else, but boy does it like super unleaded. And actually on short term drive, my short term memory ranges, but I've had it a bit lower than that. If you go for a spirited drive, then you can be looking at, you know, low teens. I think if you were sensible with the loud pedal and you just sat on the motorway and cruised, I'm just sat with the cruise control at 70 miles an hour, you'd probably get that up into the low 20s maybe, but it is, it is a thirsty car. 
but it's a supercar, right? I can't imagine too many people buy one of these and worry about what the MPG is going to be. So that is the end of my week with the R8 V10 Performance Rear Wheel Drive Edition. I really didn't want to give it back and I enjoyed every moment. I hope you enjoyed the video as much as I enjoyed driving the car. If you did, give me a thumbs up. Comments below are always welcome. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Petrobed for plenty more content to come. And I'll see you on the next film, guys. You take care. Drive safe.